My name is Eric Scholl. I'm a product manager with the Instrumentation Products Division of Parker Hannafin out of our headquarters in Huntsville, Alabama. Good to have everybody here today to learn a little bit about basic uh, tube fabrication, a little bit about fitting makeup and uh, tube bending. Um, first of all, we want to talk about tubing because a lot of times we talk about fittings and we don't talk about uh, the sealing surfaces actually on the tube. That's a very important concept to know that you never know where your sealing surface is going to be on the tube, so you need to be taking care of the tube. Uh, when you store it or you prepare it. Uh, things we want to talk about is you always want to match materials uh, and we'll talk about each of these topics. Select the proper tubing hardness, the wall thickness, and the proper uh, tubing surface finish. Okay, examples of matching materials. Uh, stainless steel fittings, we go with stainless steel tubing. Carbon steel fittings with carbon steel tubing. And brass fittings would go with uh, um, copper tubing. Um, with, would only be the really real exception and uh, um, a couple reasons and these are two main reasons we don't want to or don't want to discourage mixing materials is when you have two different materials together you have what we call galvanic corrosion I know that's a big name and some of you maybe have had some chemistry or not but if you put two different materials together and you have an electrolyte between them you actually form a dry cell battery and, and one side starts to erode and you see that especially here on the Gulf Coast we have a lot of salt spray and we want to be real concerned about that. I think the most important reason is the ferrules must be harder than the tubing. Imagine what would happen if I had some stainless steel tubing and I tried to put in a brass fitting with a brass ferrule. Do you think it would hold? No, it wouldn't. You might hold it at low pressure, but, but it, would not, it would not hold vibration, it would not hold bigger pressures. And one of the worst things other than a leak that can happen to a tube fitting is for have that tube to actually blow out and we don't want to do that so we want to make sure that we pay attention to the the ferrule type being with the the tube type a little bit about galvanic corrosion I already talked about this again you have two different metals with a, a kind of an electrolyte and you'll get localized corrosion that's what can happen in fittings if you mix materials and you're in an environment that uh, will uh, be toward galvanic corrosion here's an actual example uh, we took this, uh, this was on the, uh, off the flow, coast of Florida. It was actually a, uh, a control panel with uh, aluminum on the outside and had a stainless steel uh, bolt. And you can see what has already happened. We can see the pitting right here caused by galvanic corrosion. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is tubing hardness. Um, and again, for the fitting to work, the tubing must react with the ferrules. The, the ferrule must be harder than the tubing. We spoke about that already. Also, you just can't use any tubing, and we'll talk in the next couple slides about the type of tubing you use for instrumentation. There are special grades where the tubing is actually annealed, meaning there's a heat treatment process that makes it soft, so not only can the ferrule grip onto the tubing, but so you can actually easily bend the tubing, okay? And actually, if you may want to uh, refer to page 26, we have this chart, and in this we list all the specifications for the proper tubing. Now, of course, we we have a lot of materials here. Uh, we're going to be talking about stainless steel, but you could be talking about copper, carbon steel, other alloys that we use here on the Gulf Coast. But for stainless steel, for 304, 3, 304L, 316, 316L, the tubing must meet at least one of these four ASTM specs. Okay? It doesn't have to meet all four. In fact, it can't because some of these specs are for seamless, some are for welded, but at least one. And these specs call for the condition to be fully annealed. That means that it's heat treated so it's, it's soft and can be bent. And the specification for that is actually 90 RB. Some of you may not know what that is. That's a Rockwell hardness scale that is used for hardness materials. The higher that number is, the harder the material is. So we want to make sure that it's 90 RB. And if it is what it should be, if it meets these specs, it should be fully annealed and meet this spec. So this is very important that that you just don't show up with any type of tubing. You have to, it has to meet this ASTM spec at least. Very important page here in concept or else uh, fitting uh, will not work the way it's designed. <clears throat> Two major fitting designs in the industry and Parker Hannafin was the first to offer both. We have a double ferrule which looks familiar like this and we also have a single ferrule. We're going to talk about both of these um, because you may run into both out in an industry. And first of all, probably the uh, we talk about is the single ferrule design, which has this characteristic dark nut. Uh, a lot of people think that 
That's not a stainless steel nut, it actually is, but it has a molybdenum disulfite coating. And the reason for that is when you have stainless on stainless, you could have galling. If you've ever tried to put two stainless steel pipe threads together without any pipe dope or tape on it, they will actually gall. That's cold welding. You will actually, the, the material actually cold welds together. And the only way to break, to get it apart is actually to break that seal and, and destroy both threads. So that's going to be very, very important. But basically this is your typical uh, two or single ferrule design with a single ferrule here. The molly nut, which is, is, is just a coating over a stainless steel nut. A little bit how it works, we got two sealing points here. This is actually a picture of a fitting that's been made up. You'll know how it sort of bows here. It actually compresses the tube right here, but actually the, the ferrule is hardened. We put it through a heat treat process that makes it very, very hard, actually harder uh, or as hard as the, um, the tooling used to actually machine the metal here is how hard that is. So we actually, uh, we need the hardness of material to grip into the tube so we have a good gas tight seal. Uh, in the process industries, a lot of what we seal, seal are high pressure uh, and sometimes very toxic flammable gases and we've got to make sure that it seals off good to get a good metal to metal seal. So it grips there and actually seals against the body and the ferrule. So we have two seal points there on a uh, single ferrule system. Here's actually a cross section where I've actually taken a fitting that's been made up and we actually cut the ferrules off and you can see how the single ferrule actually compressed the tube but actually brought up a little dam of material. Now this is not, this does not cause a, a stress concentration there. Actually what has happened is that ferrule <coughs> compresses into the tube and moves forward and scrapes up some material. And that's what gives you your seal on the front nose of that ferrule. Now we'll go to the two ferrule design. And uh, again, this is characteristic because it has a shiny nut. Actually, to prevent the galling, what happens is the inside of the nut is actually silver plated to prevent galling. Okay? Silver plating is a, a good method of, of prevent galling, <laughs> although the molly, I think, is a better method. We have two ferrules here. We have a front ferrule and we have a single ferrule. Um, in this system, go to the next slide here, the single ferrule is actually hardened. It goes through a heat treat process. The front ferrule compresses the tube, and we have a seal point here and at the interface between the body seat and the front ferrule. But I actually, the rear ferrule actually grips in in a similar fashion the way the single ferrule did because it's harder than the tube and will prevent any gas leaks. And we have a seal at these two points here. Uh, very quickly, that's just how a two ferrule fitting works. And again, the front ferrule is not hardened, but the rear ferrule is case hardened, just like the, the, the single ferrule CPI ferrule was case hardened. And one thing uh, that we talk about is whether we have a single ferrule or a double ferrule, both share the same body. Okay, so you may have a, uh, a body here, and I know when we make uh, fittings at Parker, this body doesn't know if it's gonna be a single ferrule or double ferrule. It is in fact the same body. Whether I put a double ferrule on it, it becomes a lock. If I put a single ferrule CPI on it, it becomes a CPI fitting. It is, in fact, the same body. Okay, and here's a cross section of actually <clears throat> on an a lock two ferrule. You'll notice the front ferrule compresses the tube, but because it's not hardened, uh, if there was any scratch here, it would, not, it would not seal off that scratch. But the rear ferrule, because it was hardened, you can see how it scraped up a little bit of metal and it would seal at that point in the event there were any excessive scratches on the tube. Okay, it's important that you select uh, the proper tube wall uh, thickness. A couple other areas to consider are chemical compatibility, system pressure, uh, sy system temperatures, and gas service, and we'll talk about uh, all four of those. You may want to refer to page, uh, what is it, 24. This is a chart we have for the tube wall thicknesses to use uh, for instrument fittings. Now, if you take a look at this along the vertical axis here, we have sizes 16th inch through 2 inch. Those are the sizes that are available in what we call instrument fittings. Along the top, horizontal, we have the common wall thicknesses. And very simply put, if you don't see a pressure rating for a given combination of two diameter wall thickness, don't use it. Okay? Now, I know sometimes when you get out there and get experience, there will be exceptions to the rule. That's when you call me and we have a conversation. But the hard and fast rule is you use only thing you have pressure ratings for. For example, half inch, 
The first wall thickness we have is O35 wall, we have a pressure rating for, and the thickest wall is O83. Now what would happen if I picked too thin of a wall, the, the tubing wouldn't have enough strength to resist the ferrules and therefore would not create a good seal. You would have a leakage. If I picked too thick of a wall, you would absolutely seal, but the fitting is not designed to hold to that strong a tube and you may tend to stress the threads you can maybe tear the threads, but the big portion, the big thing is under high pressure, the tube would not burst as a mode of failure. It would blow out, and under high pressure, that's a dangerous thing. So, um, the main thing is, is always verify your tube wall th thickness, and a lot of times you'll be given that as a specification, but make sure it's appropriate for the pressure you have, and do not go outside these boundaries without some sort of consultation with the factory. Very important there. Uh, one thing I'll point out, this is the same chart, but you'll notice part of this area is grayed out and part of it is not. What we have here, there are select, and this is, uh, every uh, manufacturer has pressures that vary a little bit, but I think most of them follow this format. Let's say, let's go back to our half inch tube example. You'll notice 035 wall is grayed out. We would prefer not to use that for gas service with the exception of instrument air. You'll learn that instrument air is used in a lot of these for different control valves and so forth. A lot of times that instrument air is definitely under 200 PSI, more commonly under 150 PSI, and that's okay. But if you're using, you know, anything like hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, helium, or any kind of gases like that, we would prefer that you would go to a thicker wall, 049, because What's harder to seal, a liquid or a gas? Gas molecule is smaller, so it's harder to seal. We want to make sure that that tube is thicker so that ferrule grips into the surface and has a proper seal, okay? That's not to say that it won't work at absolutely at all in 035 wall, but it needs to be pristine tubing, absolutely no scratches on it at all. But this is just a guideline we use, and I think most manufacturers uh, uh, follow that. Again. We would prefer that the unshaded area be used for gas service and then the shaded area could be uh, for, for liquid service. Okay, another one is just general uh, chemical and temperature compatibility and I believe you'll find that on page 21 in your book. And again, I just want to deal with stainless steel. General uh, temperatures, basically the, the one I want to focus on here is 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the absolute uh, max that you want to take stainless steel to. There's more we could talk about on that, but as long as you know that's a top ceiling for what you want to see for stainless steel. <clears throat> temperature derating, um, you'll learn that as you go up in temperature, the, the strength of material goes down. And um, how we'll know that is, for example, if we'll, let's just go on this uh, previous chart. Let's take half inch, um, oh, 65 wall, 5100 degrees, or 5100 PSI. What we would do, if we were taking that to 1,000 degrees, we would come over here and say, okay, I've got 316 stainless steel uh, tubing. I would take that, uh, that uh, pressure and I would multiply it by 0.77 and that would be my new pressure rating at 1,000 degrees. That's how this works. And notice that we don't have any derating factor above 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's the ceiling of which stainless steel, the maximum stainless steel can go. Okay. And also notice that uh, the derating for 316 stainless, you don't start derating until you get above 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? But anyway, very useful chart to use. Um, one thing, we always want to inspect the tube surface. Now, uh, this right here is not a good example of instrument tubing. That's probably not a good example of conduit or pipe. Okay? Because conduit and pipe, you don't see on the outside. Remember, the instrument tube you never know where you're going to cut that and where your sealing surface is going to be, so you need to respect it. And we'll talk about that on how to store it and take care of it because we need to treat that like we could seal on any part of that tube. And we want to protect the tubing surface um, from different scratches and everything. The, the rule of thumb I have is if you can take your thumb and you can feel that scratch, you probably need to work around it and cut out of it. Now, if you look at it under light, light tends to magnify and there's going to be some light buffing marks in slight scratches on all tubing, but that gets magnified by the light. But if you can actually figure it with your thumb, you want to work around it, cut it out, and make sure that a ferrule or a, a fitting doesn't get near that section of tube. 
It doesn't mean that tube's bad, but it means that section of the tube, you do not want a ferro gripping onto it. Okay, I've got some examples here of, of different places I've been to give you some ideas what we mean about tube storage. This is probably the ultimate tube storage. This is actually offshore where we were concerned not only about physically protecting this, but also environmentally. And the reason we want to talk about environmentally, remember out offshore we've got the salt spray that can get in there that cause premature corrosion and, and contamination. And here we actually have some, some piping that actually, let me back up here, some piping that actually has some O-ring seals here to environmentally protect that tube. So we're, we're concerned about physical damage to the tube, environmental corrosion, galvanic corrosion, and also any sort of contamination. Other sources of contamination would be, for example, out in a fab shop. You may have a big skid being fabbed up by the welders. They're welding and grinding everything. And I was at a shop once where right next door were where the instrument guys were. And all the grinding scale and everything was going up into the environment and actually getting into the fittings and actually getting into the threads of the fittings. They couldn't make up the fitting. The solution was on the shop floor we protected the fittings from any sort of environmental Danger. We put some cabinets in and you only took fittings out when you're ready to use them. You didn't leave them there overnight so the grinding dust wouldn't get out of there. So you just use some common sense as far as that goes. So this is the ultimate protection for uh, physical damage and any type of environmental corrosion. Uh, here are some examples, some different tubing racks you can see. Uh, various ones. Note how you can just pull the tubing off and it protects it. Different, different examples of that. Okay. We also want to talk about tube support. Uh, there's a whole lot to learn on that and there's a lot of tube clamp manufacturers and other places that give you um, the distance to put tube supports depending on the wall thickness and diameter of the or length of the tubing. Um, but right here we just want to make you aware to use the proper tube supports that tube supports are necessary for different routings. And also when I talk about tube routing and this is part of the skill that comes in being a tube fabrication is being able to look at where you're, where you're at and where you're going to be and where's the best way to get to it. Now, here's a great example. Here's kind of a before. You can see that there's a straight run where the tubing tray goes and everything looks good, but what someone didn't consider, look at these pressure switches and gauges. Someone's going to have to get in there and calibrate those. That may be you, you, or you. How would you like to show up to the job site and all those are covered up with this tube tray? How are you going to get back there? It's going to be rather difficult, isn't it? Well. Fortunately, whoever did this, they had them replummet, and it took a little extra effort to make these 90 degree bends, but look how much easy and accessible it is right here to get these pressure switches and gauges, which we know will need calibration from time to time. That's what's using common sense. Always look around your environment. Where are you going to? Are you going to get in the way of anybody else? And it may take a little extra time, and you may have to get permission for that, but it'll be worth doing it. And this is a great example of showing a before and after of why taking a little extra time uh, will benefit down the road of having accessibility. Okay, uh, when you're, we're going to uh, talk about making up fittings here toward the end of the course, but right here, here are several parallel lines, and notice the expansion loops we have here. Every other tube has a loop. What would happen if I loop these all up the same way? It may be difficult to get my wrench in to make these up. Okay, now this uh, down uh, stream here, these uh, unions are, are up here and these are all staggered. Notice how we have accessibility so you can actually get wrenches in there. That's another thing you want to pay, pay attention to because a lot of times you'll be asked to put tubing together very, very, space, space is a premium and you'll be asked to be put tubing very close together. There's going to be times you're going to have to hook different pieces on together and, and this method of staggering is a very good way of doing that. Here's another great method. Um, this is actually on a, uh, at a, a, a power plant site where off to the far side we've got a hydraulic power unit and this side is actually part of the uh, unit or, or where the hydraulics are going to be needed and look what we did here instead of staggering they fanned out these are all one inch lines by the way look how they fanned this out so again you could get the wrenches in there to actually make them up using a lot of common sense there and actually did a very very nice job of fanning that out mm -hmm.